Our society is divided. And culturally, in the academy, we have a clash between two fundamentally opposed worldviews. The one is naturalism, that believes that this universe is all that ever existed or ever will exist. And that therefore all explanation has to be bottom up in terms of mass and energy. The other worldview is theism, and in my case, Christian theism, that says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Never was there a more profound challenge to the naturalistic worldview. I remember in the 60s in Cambridge when evidence of a beginning to space-time began to come in. It was seriously resisted by the scientific establishment. The then editor of Nature, Sir John Maddox, said we cannot go down this road of believing that there was a beginning because it will give too much leverage to people who believe the Bible. In other words, here was science being resisted because it appeared to run parallel to what scripture said. Now we know that the majority of scientists believe that space-time had a beginning. But what they do not believe is that it was a creation by an intelligent God. And so although the battle lines have changed slightly, the major issue out there is, was it a creation or not? Now, of course, this has posed an immense problem for atheist scientists. Because if there was a beginning to space-time and there was nothing before, that is the absence of anything, their problem is, how do we get a universe from nothing? And the efforts made by Lawrence Krauss of ASU and Stephen Hawking recently have shown spectacularly the absurd lengths to which intelligent people will go to try to avoid the notion that there is a creator. Now, our topic tonight is not the fact that atheists and Christians agree that there was a beginning. It's not even the fact that as a Christian, I want to defend the fact that the beginning was a creation by an intelligent creator. What we're going to talk about tonight is the fact that there is an account of creation in the Bible. It is an account that has been subject to an enormous amount of study and an enormous amount of attack, particularly from non-Christian thinkers. And I want to have a look at it because it seems to me to be enormously important not only to look at it, but to think about how we look at it. Because it is the fact, it seems to me, that by far and away the most important thing about creation is that it happened. However it happened and whenever it happened. But it is also the fact that around the however and whenever, there is considerable controversy among Christians, of course, because outside that realm, people are more interested in whether it happened or not than how or when it happened. And many people have been put off, even considering the evidence for the Christian faith, because they see, whether rightly or wrongly, that aspects and sections of the Christian church appear to them to be seriously unscientific and seriously obscurantist. And that puts them into a dilemma because I have many friends, particularly in this country, who want to be faithful to Scripture. They believe in its authority, and rightly so in my opinion. But they also want to face science. And they do not want unnecessarily to be taken for fools when it comes to the understanding of science. Now, as Christians study these issues, they are being watched as to how they do it. And one of the saddest things to my mind is this. When Christians who profess to believe that Jesus Christ is the truth, and that he, above all, 
brings to us the love of God start to fight one another in a public way over issues that are not necessarily at the heart of the biblical message and therefore bring it into very serious discredit. We are being watched. And so it's important that we get some kind of perspective on what is for many people a very, very sensitive and controversial subject. Because there's a double tension. There's the question of being faithful to their understanding of the authority and inspiration of Scripture, and on the other hand, not being obscurantist when it comes to the developments in science. And so, to get some kind of perspective on this, on the way we handle controversy, I want to go back to the 16th century. Now, if we'd been living then, my lecture tonight would have been on a different topic. The topic would have been, does the earth move or not? <laughs> and you would have been fascinated to hear, I hope, what someone thought about this newfangled idea that contradicted the Bible, the claim that the earth moved. Because for centuries, of course, under the influence of Aristotle, people believed that the earth was fixed in the center of the universe and everything else revolved around it. And people thought that was pretty logical. Why does a stone thrown up in the air come straight down? If the earth is moving, why doesn't it come down a bit further along the way? And so on. Why do not we feel a strong wind blowing in our faces in the direction of the earth's motion and so on? Now, it wasn't only the intellectual scientists of the day who believed it. The Christians believed it because they read the Bible. For instance, in the Psalms, they saw... God sets the earth upon its foundation so that it should never be moved. Or 1 Samuel 2, for the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and on them he has set the world. So there is scripture saying that the earth doesn't move. And this upstart, Copernicus, and after him Galileo, claims it does move. And that caused the initiation of a great questioning in the Europe of the day. Now, we are in an interesting situation because I suspect that the vast majority in this room believe that the earth moves. That poses an interesting question for the Christians among us, if there are any. How is it you've come to believe that the earth moves when scripture says it doesn't move? Interesting, isn't it? And nobody gives a thought to it because we've long since, but it took 1,700 years to sort this one out. And I want to discuss it a little bit with you, with you because it's comfortable enough because it's distant. But the fact is that the Bible says the earth is fixed so it doesn't move. And the other fact is none of us believes it doesn't move. So we're in a quandary, aren't we? And we have to face it. So let's have a look at this to see why it is we're not all fixed earthers. <laughs> the question, of course, comes down to this. How do we understand the Bible? That was the question at stake during the Galileo controversy. So let's think of some general principles of understanding one should, of course, in the first instance, be guided by the natural understanding of a passage. The reformers in the 15th and 16th centuries adopted an approach which they called the literal method. They didn't mean literal in the way we often use it, though. They meant the sense of interpretation of a text which is obtained by taking its words in their natural or customary meaning and applying the normal rules of grammar. Now, that's enormously important because, of course, when we come to the fundamental doctrines of Christianity, they are first and foremost to be understood in their natural primary sense. Creation is not a metaphor for anything. It involved an actual bringing into existence of the cosmos. The cross of Christ is not a metaphor in the first instance. It is an actual crucifixion. It has, of course, significance way beyond that and so on. 
But that basic principle needs immediate qualification because, of course, if we ask for the natural reading, there can be more than one. For instance, in Genesis 1, the word earth is first used for the planet, and then a little later it's used for the dry land as distinct from the sea. Now, both times the word earth is clearly meant literally, but there are two different literal meanings. So we must be open for that possibility. Then, there are many places where a basic literal understanding won't work. Let's take the statement that Christ made. I am the door. It's clearly not meant to be understood in the primary literal sense of a door made of wood or steel or plastic. It is meant metaphorically. But now here we need to listen to C.S. Lewis. Because the word door in that statement is a metaphor, that does not mean it doesn't stand for something real. It does. Jesus claims to be a door in a very real way, a door into a spiritual experience of God that we can ourselves experience. That experience is literal at that level, but it's not literal at the primary level. Do you see the difference? But that shows you that the word literal is a very slippery word to use. Now, we're used to dealing with this in language, in ordinary conversation. The thing some of us need to do is to get used to it when it comes to the Bible. Now, I want to say something else. How is it that I know that when Jesus said, I am the door, he didn't mean one of those? It's through my experience of real doors, isn't it? In other words, generalizing slightly, it is through my experience of the natural world science, if you like. You see, what escapes many of us is the fact that our interpretation of almost anything depends critically on our experience. So when we hear Jesus say, I am the door, because we know what a door in the physical sense means, we immediately go up to the next level. So it is, in that generalized sense, science that's helping us. So we needn't despise our experience of the natural world too rapidly. So the word literal being almost useless for discussion purposes is often replaced by the word literalistic when it comes to the primary sense and the primary sense alone. Now, of course, if with that in mind, we ask the question, what level should a text be read? It's often obvious. But sometimes it's not so obvious, and that's, of course, where all the controversy begins. Now, think of the moving earth controversy. For many years, if not centuries, there would have been two groups. At the first, a big group of fixed earthers and a tiny group of moving earthers. But as time went on and evidence came in more and more, the group of moving earthers grew and the group of fixed earthers got less and less. And they had to somehow come to terms with the idea that scripture appeared to say that the earth was fixed and it didn't move. So what were they going to do? Now, were the people who began to believe in a moving earth just people who'd given up on the authority of scripture and jumped on the bandwagon of science, or what? Well, let's think about it. Let me make clear that I am a scientist who believes that scripture is the fully inspired word of God and authoritative. I'm not shy, therefore, of drawing scientific implications from it when warranted, but saying that scripture has scientific implications, like, for instance, the fact that it for centuries has announced that there was a beginning, and scientists only began to look for it in about the 1960s, I have frequently suggested to scientists, perhaps if they'd taken the Bible a bit more seriously, they'd have looked for evidence of a beginning a lot earlier. But be that as it may, the important thing to realize is, although there are parts of scripture that talk about the physical universe, that is, they've got the same subject matter as science, the Bible is clearly not a scientific textbook. I do not teach Newton's laws from Leviticus. And John Calvin, no less, said in his commentary on Genesis, nothing is here treated of but the visible form of the world. He who would learn astronomy and other recondite arts, let him go elsewhere. 
But it's very important having realized that that the Bible answers actually the more important questions, the why questions of purpose, rather than the how questions of how it works. That nonetheless, Scripture has truth to tell about the objective reality that we call the physical universe. And therefore, we must try to understand what it is and what it isn't that the Bible has to say on this topic. Now, many years ago, centuries ago, Augustine, had some advice as to how Christians should engage with science. Usually, he wrote, even a non-Christian knows something about the earth, the heavens. And this knowledge he holds as to be as certain from reason and experience. Now, it is a disgraceful and dangerous thing for an infidel to hear a Christian presuming to give the meaning of Holy Scripture, talking nonsense on these topics. And we should take all means to prevent such an embarrassing situation in which people show up vast ignorance in a Christian and laugh it to scorn. He then says this. If they find a Christian mistaken in a field which they themselves know well and hear him maintaining his foolish opinions about our books, how are they going to believe those books in matters concerning the resurrection of the dead, the hope of eternal life, and the kingdom of heaven. And I think what Augustine has done there is put his finger on the problem that many people face. They want to trust rightly the authority of scripture, but they do not want unnecessarily to appear idiotic when it comes to the results of contemporary science. Now, Augustine is not suggesting, of course, that Christians should not be prepared to face ridicule over fundamental doctrines of the Christian message, like the deity of Christ, his resurrection, and so on. Such ridicule is often based on the false notion that science has made it impossible to believe in miracles. That has been evident since the very beginning of Christianity, and it occurs today, as I have very good cause to know. I am not ashamed, ladies and gentlemen, to say that as a scientist, I believe that Jesus Christ literally rose from the dead on the third day. So I'm not ashamed of appearing to look a fool in front of my colleagues who would deny that on some very erroneous arguments derived from David Hume. On the other hand, I am not prepared to say beyond what it appears to me that scripture says on certain other issues. And it is that, of course, we need to discuss. Now, I've mentioned the question of what is central to Christianity and what isn't. But, of course, that's usually part of the problem. That one group believes that what they hold is central and the other doesn't. But I notice one thing that ought to help us. Among people who are convinced of the authority and inspiration of Scripture, you usually get no disagreement about the fact of creation, about the incarnation, about the miracles of Jesus, about his atoning death, his resurrection, and his return. But you do find disagreement about the interpretation of Genesis 1. Now, that fact alone ought to make us humble. There is something here to be thought about, no matter where we are coming from. Now, what about Augustine's advice? You see, looking at the moving earth, fixed earth controversy, we now know that the earth does not rest on literal foundations or pillars made of stone, concrete, or steel. We can see that the words foundation and pillar are used in a metaphorical sense, but Lewis, again, it's a metaphor for a reality. That is, foundation stones of a temple give stability to the edifice. Now, what science has uncovered are the extremely sensitive and complex mechanisms due to the moon, due to Jupiter, and so on, that keep the Earth stable in its orbit. And so most of us, I think, are comfortable with the idea that the Saab was expressing the truth using a metaphor for a reality. That is, the Earth is literally stable, but not in the sense of having pillars upholding it. You see? So... That kind of thinking brought people to the point where they realized this. Now, I'm going to say this very carefully because it's very important to me, and it's this. They looked at Scripture 
And they saw that although you could interpret it in terms of the earth being fixed and not moving, you didn't have to. Shall I repeat that? They saw that although you could interpret scripture and say the earth is fixed, you didn't have to. And you didn't have to in such a way that did not compromise any doctrine whatsoever. And so, of course, we are all, I take it, moving earthers. Now, it seems to me that we ought to learn something from that. Because for centuries, if we transported ourselves back six or seven centuries, everybody in this room, whether they were Christian or not, would have been a fixed earther. And you will find that Luther and Calvin were very clear in what they believed about the earth not moving. Are we to write them all off? No, of course not. Because at that time, it didn't seem ridiculous to believe in a fixed earth because that was the best of their knowledge at the time. What happened historically was that knowledge moved on, the interpretation of nature changed, and so people had to look again at the scripture and said, how can we hang on to this? Well, of course, obviously, we can do it this way. And now we do it without thinking. And it seems to me that is a paradigm case for today. Could it be that the controversy about the age of the planet and the interpretation of Genesis 1 fits into a very similar, though not an identical, category? Well, let me say something briefly about it. Because I believe in Socrates' questioning method, I'm going to give you time for questions. So please be thinking of them, because in this very short lecture, I can only do a sketch of the ideas here. Now, throughout the ages, many have held that there can be straight lines drawn from the creation week of Genesis to the week of ordinary life. And indeed, this is the Jewish year 5773 dated according to the Jewish calendar from creation. The reformers Luther and Calvin, who believed in a fixed earth, also held the 24-hour view. But there were others in the ancient world, long before Darwin or anybody else like that had ever been heard of, who suggested that, as Justin Mart Martyr put it, that the days might have been long ages. He noticed that one of the Psalms said, a thousand years in your sight are ours but yesterday, but it is past. And in the second century, Clement of Alexandria thought that creation could not take place in time at all, since, I quote, time was born along with things which exist. And Augustine, who wrote a great deal about Genesis, openly stated in his book, The City of God, that he found the days of Genesis difficult. In fact, he held that God had created everything in a moment, and that the days represented a sequence used simply to explain it to us. Now, these men were not armchair theorists. And they existed long before the days of modern science. Many of them gave their lives, of course, for their Christian faith. So let's come to these Genesis days. The interpretations are many. I've counted 15 or 16, I think. But they morph into three or four main streams. Number one, the 24-hour view. The days are 24-hour days of one Earth week less than 10,000 years ago. Two, the day-age view. The days represent successive periods of time of unspecified length. Three, the framework view. The days are not in chronological order, but they're in a logical order. The first three days representing form, and the second three representing fullness. The sky filled with birds, the sea filled with fish, and the earth filled with animals and human beings. And then there is the view that they are days of revelation the time during which God revealed it to man. Now, that's a lot to take in at one blush, but I suspect most of you are familiar with this. But one thing I want to illustrate is the difference between logical and chronological order. If you compare Genesis 1 with Isaiah 45, 12, you'll see what I mean. Here's Isaiah. I made the earth and created man on it. It was my hands that stretched out the heavens, and I commanded all their hosts. If you take that as a chronological statement, it means the earth was made before the heavens. But is it meant to be taken chronologically or is it meant to be taken logically? When we are describing things, we often mix those two orders. 
depending on our point of view. So there are these various views. The framework view is one that is very much to the fore these days, particularly the version of it given by John Walton called the Cosmic Temple View. That is, I repeat the idea that the first three and the second three days are in parallel. I would just make a simple observation that the fact that they are in parallel is fairly obvious. But the second thing is, it doesn't mean that there's no chronology. You can't put birds in a sky that's not already there, to put it crudely. So even the framework view has implications of an implied chronology. Now, what should we think of all these different interpretations? Well, they make me very careful. And I do not claim, ladies and gentlemen, to have a definitive solution of this, but what I want to share with you, a number of things that have helped me think about it. The first thing we note is that they are different interpretations of the same text. Now that is interesting because it means that people have a certain difficulty in understanding what this text means. And I suspect a lot of it comes from, in my experience, that not enough time has been taken to see what the text actually says, as distinct from what it means. Now, those two flow into each other. But what I'm going to try to do tonight is very briefly look at this again and take you through it and see what it says. If you look at the first chapter of Genesis, you first of all have a statement regarding the creation of the heavens and the earth in the first two verses. Then we have six days of God's creation and organizational activity culminating in the creation of human beings in God's image. And then we have the seventh day of God's rest. So it's a very simple, an introduction, a middle, the six days, and as Aristotle would say, an ending. So that the initial immediate impression is a chronological sequence of events, the briefest, if you like, of brief histories of time. It starts with an earth that is without form and void. There's nothing much there. It ends with the earth full of all kinds of life. And culminating the process is the highest form of life human beings made in the image of God. Let me just stop there. The very fact of a sequence is fascinating. Because it seems to be saying, whatever you believe about the days that God did not create everything at once. There is a sequence with a goal. And what is the goal? It's human beings made in the image of God. Ladies and gentlemen, our world desperately needs to hear this today. Human beings are the only creature or thing in the entire physical universe that are said to be made in the image of God. The heavens declare the glory of God. It is nowhere said they were made in his image. You were made in God's image. And that distinguishes you above every other creature. You don't need me to remind you that in America and in the United Kingdom today, there is enormous pressure to devalue human beings to just another species. And before we get into the details here, just let's see what this text is actually saying. It's saying that you, as a human being, are uniquely valued because you are made in the image of God. That is an immensely powerful and important message. X bằng 5 cos của bi nhân cho 10 cộng thêm cho bi nữa. Đúng không ạ? Đây cos của 10 bi nó là số chẵn rồi, chúng ta buông ra, chúng ta bỏ đi. Đúng không ạ? Chúng ta bỏ đi. Như vậy chỉ còn cos của bi thôi. Cos của bi các bạn chiếu vào nó bằng bấm máy nó ra là trừ -1. Trừ -1 nhân 5 thì ra trừ -5 cm. Tức là lúc này nó đang ở vị trí biên âm. Đúng chưa? Lúc này nó đang ở vị trí biên âm nha. Rồi, bây giờ thầy trò chúng ta sẽ tiếp tục đi qua cái phần C đó là bài tập trắc nghiệm của ông ta. Thì trong cái video này thầy sẽ để cái file của những cái câu này nó nằm dưới phần mô tả. Bạn nào có thể tải về thì chúng ta tham khảo thêm. Ngoài ra các bạn có thể thầy ở đây thầy có rất là nhiều bài tập trong cái phần trắc nghiệm này nó cũng có nhiều bài tập. 
Ở đây trong video này thầy sẽ giải cho, chi tiết cho các bạn năm cái bài tập đầu tiên của phần trắc nghiệm này Còn những cái bài khác thì chúng ta tự làm Rồi có gì thắc mắc thì chúng ta cứ để lại bình luận Thầy sẽ giải thích sớm cho các bạn Bây giờ chúng ta qua cái bài số 1 một chiếc điểm dao động điều hòa có quý đạo là một đoạn thẳng dài 10 cm, biên độ dao động là bao nhiêu? Thì các bạn rằng biết rằng ví dụ như chất điểm này đây nó dao động trên quý đạo, đúng không? Đây là vị trí cân bằng O. Đây là điểm đây là bin dương, đây là bin âm. Đúng không? Quý đạo của nó chính là bằng cái đoạn này. Và cái đoạn này chính là 2A. Như vậy tìm A các bạn lấy quý đạo chia 2, 10 chia cho 2 được 5. Được chưa? Và lưu ý biên độ của chúng ta luôn luôn là số dương Các bạn không được chọn đáp án là trừ 5 nha Bài số 2 Một chiếc điểm dao động điều hòa Trong 10 dao động toàn phần đi được quãng đường là 120 giây Tính quý đạo chuyển động Hỏi quý đạo chuyển động uh, 